can bless you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord God, we worship you, we bless you, we praise you, we give you thanksgiving and honor and praise, we worship you, we thank you for your presence, we thank you for your word, we thank you for your goodness, we thank you for your love, thank you, thank you, Lord God, we forget not all the benefits of our covenant, thank you, Lord God, we remember the benefits of our covenant, we forget not all, we worship you, and God, we bless you, and we praise you, and we thank you, and we worship you, we Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. Wednesday night live from Odessa, Florida, February the 21st, 2024. My goodness, it's the clock running. I remember when I was in school, I remember we read George Orwell's 1984. <laughs> and it was a prediction of the future. It was such a prediction of the future, you know. And uh, one of the fascinating uh, um I, I, I think, was it in 19, it was either in 1984 or it was in the Animal Farm. I forget, both of those were required reading, you know. But um, one of the things that happened was um, that the media people were supposed to believe. And the media was closely guarded so that they didn't present opposing viewpoints. And all that happened was they would present what they wanted you to know. And somewhere along the process, the end, they were at war with one enemy, and all of a sudden they changed, and they were at war with the next enemy, you know? Uh -huh. And uh, and so the media immediately changed, you know? And the, one of the characters, and I think it was, it was 1984, I think, uh, one of the characters seemed to remember, that's not who we're at war with, you know? We were at war with, with, the, with the other people. And yet there was no real way to, uh, um, there was no real way and uh, uh, the, the and the animal farm was one of the lines I appreciated from the animal farm was that and this is boy if this is true in our country it was that all of the animals are equal. See that it was the, the idea was that that uh, uh, they were going to take over the the, the the different animals they were they they wanted co basically communism is what they wanted where everybody was equal you know and uh, but the pigs were the most equal. And, uh, and so that's what they said. They said, and the slogan that they came up with was, all the animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> and what struck me about 1984 was how close we've come to it, you know. Uh, and this is, we're way beyond 1984. But the media bombards you every single day. They want you to believe. And, and I... You know, I, I'm not saying whether this is true. I'm not saying whether it's not true or not. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. But uh, they want you to believe that Donald Trump is a skunk, a philanderer, an adulterer, a cheater, a liar, a thief, and an insurrectionist, you know? Right. And they bombard the news waves every single day with that. Uh, I mean, it's literally every day, all day long, the, the news media is filled with negative articles about Donald Trump. There's never a positive article about Don, Donald Trump. Now, certainly some of the people of our country must find that they, <laughs> they must find something else. You know? <laughs> because his, his standing in the polls would indicate that all the people are not receiving what the media, what the media is trying to tell them. Right. But the, the, and the point is whether Donald Trump is good or whether Donald Trump is not good. I, I don't know. You, you vote for whoever you want. You make the decision, whatever you want to make the decision. We would never presume to tell somebody what decision that they should make concerning that matter. But I will tell you this. You can be led by the media right. and do not rely on what the media says, you know, concerning those, those kinds of situations. But I'm just so struck with that. Yes. I'm also, I just, I'm thankful tonight, and I just, you know, I say this routinely, but I'm so grateful. You know, the, the Bible talks about, and uh, let me see if I can find it inside. Hidden riches and secret places. Where is that, Val? Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. I knew that. I just want to find out if she remembered. Oh, no. I don't know. going on Yeah, I don't Yeah. I don't think they see that at home. Oh, good. Okay. Thus said the Lord to his anointed the Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him, the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. 
I will go before him. I will make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in some of the treasures of the darkness, hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, and the God of Israel. I will give thee treasures of darkness and hidden riches and secret places. Back when, right after Pastor Gail and I got married, which was almost, we were married for over 30 years, we began to get a hold of that verse, you know, that there are hidden riches and secret places. And um, when you grab a hold of a verse and you begin to meditate that verse, <coughs> excuse me, what's that with you? And he'll begin to explode that verse on the inside of you. He'll begin to blow it up. He'll yes. begin to reveal to you, uh, you know, basically what his intention was concerning that verse. And over a period of time, now, I will tell you that that particular verse, you know, we grabbed a hold of that almost 30 years ago and began to meditate it, and God has blown it up. But it's not over. It's continued to expand, continue of what it is. And I have come to realize that the greatest treasure that God gave us, the thing that was the hidden riches and secret places, was to be able to, to serve him as a ministry. And what a gift, what a wonderful, extraordinary thing. And, you know, the ministry that God gave us, it doesn't look like what anybody else's looks like. And, uh, it, I mean, it does not look like uh, anybody else's looks like. And that's a wonderful thing. What I want is I want what God wanted for me. See, it's it's one thing to want, you know, we say, well, I want what God wanted. No, I want what God wanted for me. Uh, because, you know, there's a lot of things God wants out there that he doesn't have me to participate in. He doesn't want me to be a part of. But I want what he wanted for me. And um, that's a, a, a that because when, when I come into agreement with what he wanted for me and I begin to truly pursue what he wanted for me and to leave alone the things that he didn't want for me, when I say, when I can turn my back and say, no, you know what? That might look desirable to my natural. I know what God had for me. When I can come to that place, I can truly grow into the callings and assignments that God had for my life. And that's where true joy is. That's where, where the, the, the joy of life yes. is, is, is rooted and grounded in pursuing the things that God had for you to pursue with your life. And so it's truly been a hidden riches and secret places. And I didn't see that, you know, in, in the beginning, as probably did most people. But what a joy it is, what a pleasure it's been. Because it's allowed us, it's given us the freedom to focus on what God said. And uh, a number of years ago, uh, uh, I think some, something a little over 10 years ago, the Lord spoke to me in a dream one night, and he said, I, I want you to take over the office of prayer. And what does that mean? You know, I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't really, I didn't really know, but the dream was very clear. And I remember the dream to this day, you know. I mean, and one of the things about dreams is uh, that they, a, a dream is not something that is, uh, that, that, that enters your consciousness and enters your memory. If the dream is from God, it is written on your spirit. Yes. And it's, I mean, it's, it's sort of like, like uh, etched in stone on your spirit, and it doesn't go away. And you remember that dream, and that dream I had all those years ago. I remember that dream, just crystal clear, just like I had it last right. night. And it's true with, with many, many dreams like that. I mean, I remember dreams I had 30 years ago that were just crystal clear for a night of night because, you know, God was communicating a truth that he wanted me to have. Communicate the truth is an eternal truth that he's, he's communicating to you. That's an important thing to remember because when God gives you revelation knowledge concerning a particular matter, it is a fundamental truth it's a fundamental situation that he wants you to. In other words, I want you to get this because this is an eternal truth. And it's true today, but it's true tomorrow, and it'll be true for yes. every tomorrow of your life. Amen. It was also true in all the yesterdays of your life, even though you didn't know it. Right. You know, Even though you didn't, didn't understand what it was, it was still true back Amen. then. But now that you do know it, you can pursue the truth Amen. because it's the truth that sets you free. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. We bless you, Lord God. I just I think I've been free to pursue the things that uh, that God had for us in, in the ministry, and that's a, a, an extraordinary thing. Um, his his, but what he said about the prayer, it it took me a long time.
to really begin to have an understanding of what he was talking about. Right, right. Uh, and uh, Pastor Gail, of course, Pastor Gail and I, we're one flesh, you know, we're together in the ministry. We're together in our lives. We're together in our, you know, we spend a lot of time together. Um, but we're together in our thoughts. We, we are one flesh. Married in all three realms of existence. We're married body, soul, and spirit. And so we're together. We're one flesh in all three realms of existence. And uh, that's a powerful thing. Because she can walk out something that I was supposed to do. And it helps me. And it becomes part of who we are. Yes, uh, as yes. a couple. And that's what happened with the ministry of prayer. The pastor Gil began to really run with that and pick that up and ran with it. And just did a, has done a fantastic job of, of developing a prayer ministry. And this past weekend was uh, where we had our uh, a prayer event. I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and call it an annual prayer event. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know that it's been probably more than a year since we did one of those, I guess, or has it? Well, we did the event in Easter of 22. Okay. That was a week-long prayer. That was two prayer. years. Yeah, that was two years ago. A week-long prayer. Uh, right. Well, I remember we did uh, back in um, approximately 2015 or 16, we did uh, a, a prayer summit. And if you remember, that was when Mary Smith came. And we spent, uh, I think we met for almost a whole week uh, with the subject of prayer. It was a weekend for sure. No, it's longer than that because our, I, I, it was a little bit longer than that, but I think Mary yeah. was with us for three or four the days. Summer, when we prayed for two, the two days, for five, I thought it was two days. Well, we, we no, I think we, we prayed two days all day. Right. Uh, from like eight, actually I think it was three days. I think we prayed, I think it was a Saturday, a Sunday, and a Monday. I think we prayed all day from, from eight in the morning to five in the afternoon. Right. And then, uh, but the re- remainder of the week, we continued on. And we had a camping. We had our focus on prayer mm-hmm. in that particular uh, uh, time frame. So we, we've been pursuing that, that subject. And as we begin to pursue it, what's happened is God has begun to give us revelation concerning that. One of the things I realized that, what, what, that you know, there's, God always has multiple objectives in the things that he, he does. One of the things that God wanted was that we would be able to teach other people we'd be able, um, you know because if, if there's one thing I have absolutely been been, been been so convicted of and convinced of is that people don't know how to pray and so what happens is they don't get what they're praying for because they don't know how to do it you know and there's a there's an education process that we should all go through in learning how to pray so that we know that if we're coming in prayer, we're not wasting our time, we're not wasting our effort. Because, you know, there is a spiritual law, and the spiritual law governs everything that we do. It's their natural laws, but prayer is governed by spiritual law. And uh, what we need to do yes. is, and, and it's governed by spiritual yes. protocol. And if we yes. are going to effectively pray to receive what we want, then we're going to have to be governed by the spiritual protocol, and we're going to have to be governed by spiritual law. And we're going to have to know what they are so that we can be governed by those things. Well, so part of this process of God speaking to us about that has been to learn and understand those things that God had for us so that we we do, in fact, know what they were. Um, Once again, it's, it's, you know... um, it's, it's important that we, see, you know, the, the truth is the whole world prays, even the atheists pray, you know, they may not admit it, but they pray to something, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, New Age prays, you know, Hindus pray, Buddhists pray, um, but, but obviously the protocol is very different, you know, between different faiths and the faith of Christianity. You know, and what we need to know is we need to just make sure that we know the protocol and the spiritual laws that govern Christian prayer, which, which he has for us. And so we, we've grown in that, I think, over the period of time. And we talked a little bit on Sunday about, you know, how, how do you get what God, you know, what you want from God? How, what, what's that process look like, you know? And I did a, a little essay on it. It's on our website. It's on our Give Me a Year doc net website and it's uh, just labeled prayer and uh, I did that a number of years ago 
And obviously, even when we're doing something like that, if we're writing a book on a particular subject, by the time you finish the book, your knowledge is ground from what you're working on, you know, and you I should have included it in the book, and I didn't, you know, because my knowledge is now grown. But you can keep writing and rewriting and rewriting. And so what we discovered was, no, just get it in there and get it out there, you know. Right, right. Because there's somebody at every different level that yes. needs, to, uh, that needs to, to, to know that. Anyway, so we, we talked a little bit on Sunday. Now, if you go back and pick up some of the, the, uh, um, some of the uh, conditions of prayer and the situations, of, uh, because once again, you want to know how to pray effectively to get what you're praying for. That's such a critical thing to, to receive. In other words, if we're going to go before God in prayer, we're going to ask for something, I want to know that I've got at least a chance of getting what I want, you know, what, what, what I'm praying about. And uh, one of the great discoveries we make when praying, you know, it's not about your master of words. Um, and, and even the, the Bible says, you know, that, that you know, they who, who pray with many words before men to be seen before men, they got their reward, you know. And they're not going to get one from heaven, but they got their reward from, from the, you know, the, the awe of men and the respect of the men. Um, so uh, praying is not about your skill with words. You know, it's not about skill in, in praying. It's about the condition of the heart yes. of the one that's Amen. praying. And, uh, and everything springs forth out of that condition. Yes. And, and one of the reasons why is that because faith flourishes in a pure heart. Mm -hmm. See, you know, who, uh, Psalm 24 says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Yes. He that has clean hands and a yes. pure heart. Yes. And, uh, and, yes. and, and, and that pure heart is the most essential ingredient to prayer. Because it opens the door for God to hear what you're praying. That's and the most important thing is is you know you God's got to be able to hear what you're asking for. And if it's if your voice is clouded by unforgiveness, doubt, unbelief, you know, faithlessness, or any of those kinds of things, your prayer just won't even get into the throne room. You know, so that's about, uh, about prayer. You know. Um, you know, I remember, uh, um, you know, and, 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 and this is the truth about our country, that, you know, our country, we, we have practiced religious tolerance for many, many years. And we, we tolerate, in, in this country, there's a separation of church and state, and we tolerate every faith, you know, except Christianity. You know? <laughs> That's the one that we're most intolerant of. And, and I remember George Bush, George Jr., the, the younger, George Bush, the younger, uh, he made a comment one time that he, you know, they asked him, well, how do you receive, you know, how do you know what to do? And he said, well, I pray about it. And he said, I pray about it, and I seek the Lord about it, and I get guidance from, you know, Jesus Christ, and I get guidance, and that's what I do. Oh, then like, how could you lead a country, you know, by prayer to Jesus Christ? You know, and I appreciated that about him that he that he, he didn't stand and he didn't say that you know, and uh, but that's what we all should be doing you know we should be seeking the direction of the Lord and but but it's more about once again the condition of the heart and how do you, what is the condition of the heart well Mark eleven twenty two twenty uh, Mark eleven twenty two through twenty six is about faith. And certainly the first key thing about prayer is to pray in faith. Because whatsoever is, is whatsoever is sin. And so we need to pray. If we're going to pray, we've got to pray in faith. You know, and as a matter of fact, we walk by faith and not by sight. The just shall live by faith. That's what the Lord says. So faith is an essential element. But the, that passage concerning faith begin, uh, it ends by saying, if you have ought against your brother, you know, you must forgive. Because if you don't forgive your brother, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. That's such a critical, critical thing. Now that doesn't mean, once again, it doesn't mean that you 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 can't know that your brother's wrong. It doesn't mean that you can't know that that uh, you, you don't want anything to do with those people again. It just means you gotta forgive them. And forgiveness is such a Critical, critical item. And forgiveness is a sin. It sneaks in 
when you're not looking. It, it, it has a way of just being able to come in under the radar, you know, when, when you don't know. And so one of the things that's essential to prayer with a pure heart, prayer with a pure spirit, is repentance. And to, to repent. And repent, God, if I have unforgiveness, I, I repent of that. If I have judgment, I repent of that. If I have uh, hard feelings towards other people, or whatever the situation is, one of the things that that, that for years of, of living is that in every situation where there were problems, there were two parts to the problem. You know, there's always somebody else. They may have caused the situation, but you have a part to play in that too. You know, and we're all guilty of. Well, maybe I exacerbated the situation. Maybe I were all guilty of that. And so, it's absolutely true that to 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 prepare the condition of our heart. And to be able to come before God in faith, we need to make sure that we're forgiven. But we need to repent of our part of situations and, and certain things. So we get the wisdom of God. See, the wisdom of God is pure. And this is what it says yes. in the book of James. The wisdom of God is pure. Amen. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's easy to be yes. treated. And, and the wisdom of God is the direction of God. Thank it's the knowledge of God. It's the instructions of God. All those things are contained in the wisdom of God. Yes. But if you're clouded by uh, issues that you didn't repent of, or if you're clouded by issues of unforgiveness, you won't get wisdom. And you won't, therefore, won't get the leadership that you've got. You won't get the, the, the answer from God. One of the things that, and this is, this is a, I love this verse, we won't necessarily turn there in the interest of time. But in Exodus 34, 29, what happened was Moses commandments from God. And he was there for 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he came down, the Bible says that his face shone, you know, from, from the presence of God. In other words, the light of the presence of God was in him. And he shined with the love of God. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to shine with the love of God. People are supposed to see the shine on our face because... Yeah, we've repented. We've been in the presence of God. We prayed. We 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 sought the Lord, and our countenance literally should shine as a, as a result of that. And I love that passage, and that's what should probably be one. Anyway, it's a it's a it's a, a, a powerful a passage. Anyway, I made some notes from my uh, thing here. One of the just the conditions of certainly the conditions of prayer. We talked about these on Sunday. And I'll just run through them again real quickly. You know, the, the conditions of receiving what you're believing for, you want to pray. The first one is that you love God and you're committed to God. You know, uh, I mean, if you don't love him and you're not committed to him, it's, you know, why would you pray to him? You know, because uh, you're not going to get what you're believing for. The second thing is you're committed to his word and you use his word in prayer. But I see the Bible says that God and his word are one. And when you pray the word, you activate Jeremiah 1.12 which says that he watches over his word to perform it. He doesn't watch over what you want him to do. He doesn't watch over, excuse me, he doesn't watch over your desires. He watches over his, you want God to answer the prayer. You need to have his word involved in that because he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But if you're not diligently seeking his word, diligently seeking the direction of God, then uh, what's, what's gonna happen? Is you're gonna have difficulty get, getting your prayers so because again he doesn't watch over your words, he watches over his words. So you want to attach his word to 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 your prayer. Um, the the third item in faith. And what I usually do in, in my prayer time, and you can however you want, you can do it. Um, but what I usually do is I usually have a couple of scriptures that I recite, you know, and because faith is resident in those scriptures. And for example, the 23rd Psalm, if you have the 23rd Psalm, if you have Psalm 91, if those are committed in memory, you can, you know, you can speak those. And there's something about speaking the word of God out loud that changes the atmosphere around you. And, and I'm not saying it's the secret to praying, but it's one of the secrets to make sure that you've got your faith moving in the right direction. I, I love, um, um, is it Psalm 126? Uh, I think that's it. Tell me what you're going to say. Um, when, the Lord, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them in the dream. 
Our mouths are filled with laughter and our tongues are singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for me, whereof I am glad. Turn again, I got my captivity, O Lord, like the strangers in the south. They that sow in tears will reap in joy, and he that goeth forth weeping bearing precious seed will doubtless return again. See, I want God to know that I trust his work, that I'm I'm trusting him to return to the seed. He's the, he's the Lord of the harvest. He's the reward of the seed. And you change the atmosphere around you when you speak that prayer out, when you speak his word out loud. So that's a, that's a, that's a really key thing. That's, that's learning his word, getting his word. But the other essential element of prayer and faith is to believe his word, to believe what his, his, his word said. Because you're sowing prayer. You're sowing faith. You're sowing belief. And if you're going to reap from God, you've got to sow something. You need to sow at least faith. You need to sow at least your ability to believe and to understand and to know things. So those are those are key, uh, key, key things. Um, just let's take a look at James chapter four. James is a small book, and it's always in trouble finding it. chapter 4. And, and he's talking about why you don't receive in prayer here in this passage. He says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and you war. But you ask not, you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. So in other words, what he's saying is you ask for the wrong purposes. You're not asking for the right reasons. You're not asking correctly. That you may consume it upon your lusts. In other words, you're asking for things for yourself. You know, you're, you're asking for things that are selfish. You're not asking for things that line up with what God wants. That's why it's so important to engage the word when you're, when you're praying. And uh, he says... Uh, do you think that the Spirit says in vain, the Spirit dwells in us to lust, to, to envy? In other words, to, 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 to be envious of other people or envious of situations and so forth. See, the, the, the Spirit of the world lusts for those things, but not the Spirit of God. And it says, but he gives more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resists the proud, but he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, the word says that Jesus humbled himself under the will and the direction of God. He submitted himself to the word of God and through humility. And that is the, the highest definition of humility is submission to the word of God, submission to God, submission to his word. That's humility. Now, back to what we were talking about earlier, the condition of the heart when you pray and receive. See, Jesus' condition of Jesus' his heart was perfect. He humbled himself under the mighty hand of God and submitted himself and became obedient to the will of God. That's humility. And that's what qualifies your heart to be able to receive from God. In other words, there's a qualification. When you go before prayer, I think, and I don't know exactly how they do it in the throne room, you know, but there's probably like a checking your weapons at the door kind of thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, what and God says to the angels, what's the condition of this guy's heart? You know, is he submitted to me? Is there a humility? Only God already knows, of course, what your heart is. I guess he doesn't want to be to check with the angels and that. But humility to humble yourself, and that's what he's saying here. He gives you more grace because he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. When you purpose in your heart to humble yourself. Submit yourself. Is we think that, okay, this is what I want, I'm going to go pray. That's not what prayer was supposed to be about. What prayer was supposed to be about was to get into the presence of God so that you could find out the will of God and you could line up with the will of God. 
Because you don't want what God doesn't want for you. I assure you, you do not want what God doesn't want for you. That's such a, so it's so important to submit to the will of God. It's so important to submit yourself to Him and to the Word so that you can get the direction of God. Because frequently in prayer, what's going to happen is you're going to change your mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, he, the, the Word says in Psalm 37, 4, if you delight yourself in the Lord, He'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart may not be necessarily lined up with exactly what He has. That's how He gives you the desires, is He changes your desires. He modifies your desires. If anybody had ever told me that I wanted a wife who was a, a, a holier than thou, you know, <laughs> kind of gal, I would have thought they'd lost their mind, you know. But, um, but boy, that's what I really wanted. I just didn't know. But God changed those things. And what happened is, it, as, 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 a, as an unmarried young man, I, I said to God, God, more than she loves me. I want a woman who submitted to you before she submitted me. That's the only way she's going to love me. Like, you know, like I want a, a woman to love me. That's the only way we're going to be able to live together and pursue the things that, that I want. Because I want to pursue the things of God. I've got to have a woman that wants to pursue the things of God with me. Otherwise, it just isn't going to go so well. And uh, But that, that wasn't my first request, you know. I mean, that's, you know, you, you got to get there. <laughs> but basically what I'm saying is I want a woman that submitted to you. So that if we can be a one flesh. Because we're both going to submit. That's what that's what I'd like to have uh, uh, for a wife, because then he gives you more grace, more empowerment, more ability when you are submitted, when you submitted yourself to God, when you humbled yourself under the hand of God and sought the presence and the direction of God and sought His leadership over the direction you want to go. Or where you want to go. What happens is then he gives you the empowerment to do it. But he's not going to empower you to go where he didn't want you to go. So you've got to go where he wants you to go. And there's just, again, there's a, there's a humility. There's a, there's a submission of the, of the heart. And he says there, submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee. That's a great scripture to have known. You know, because the devil comes in all kinds of different forms. The devil comes in sickness and disease. You know, he'll come in opposition. He'll come in demonic attack. He'll come in so many different ways. He'll come attacking your finances. He'll come attacking your health. He'll come attacking your relationships to resist the devil. It's easy to resist the devil when you've submitted yourself to God, when you've submitted yourself to the Word, when you believe the Word and you submit yourself in prayer to God. Now it becomes easy to resist the devil. It's much, much easier. Anyway, hallelujah, we could kind of go on and on about that. Hallelujah. Um, one of the things that, 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 that we want to, uh, to, to, to touch on is, um, let's go back to what we talked about earlier about the office of prayer. See, as you begin to learn how to pray, as you begin to learn, once again, the submission to the spiritual law, the submission to humility and things of that nature, as you learn how to pray, you begin to learn how to get the things you're praying for. You take on what God's desire is for you. God's desire for you is that you pray for the people. He understands that there are people who have needs that they don't know how to pray or they don't have the capacity to pray in faith to get what they want. And you who are developed in that, our job is to pray with people who need it, to, to be able to say that's part of the, the office of prayer. The office, so the office of prayer is about using the gift of prayer or using the, 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 the skill or the privilege of prayer that you have with God for other people. You know, that's the second part of the greatest, first and greatest commandment, you know. The second is likened to it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. You use your skill in prayer for them. You pray for them. But it also means that God can speak to you about things he wants you to pray about. See, there are things that God has 
doesn't pray those things in, they won't have. So God will speak to people. And I'll give you an example. And, and I, I know that this was from God. Back in uh, 2016, the Lord spoke to us in a prayer meeting. And uh, this was uh, uh, before the elections of the 2016 elections. Early in the year, there were the Republican field had 16 candidates in that. And uh, nobody gave Donald Trump any chance whatsoever. And the Lord said, I want you to pray for Donald Trump. He didn't say, I want you to pray that he would be, that he's my choice for president. What he said is, I want you to pray for Donald Trump. That was it. And we began to pray for, for, for Donald Trump. And of course, one by one, the other candidates dropped off. He eventually became the president. But I knew that that was what God wanted was that we would pray for him. Now, I have no doubt God spoke to many other people. And once again, I, I please, don't hear me endorsing a candidate. <laughs> I'm just telling you what God said at the time. Because, what, you know, I, I can assure you that we've been thrilled with, you know, uh, oh, in, in the past. Um, I, can, I can even give you some names. <laughs> it's just, it is what it is. But, God uses who he uses, and he, he, can, he can use the people that he uses. And just because God said, I want you to pray for Donald Trump, doesn't mean God said, I want Donald Trump to be president. You know, I didn't hear him say that. He didn't say that, you know. Um, and so, once again, I don't want you to hear me endorsing anybody. I'm just telling you, that's what God said. See, and it's part of the office of prayer, where God can you know, it's not for other people or not other situations, but God can direct you to pray for a situation that he wants prayed in. And the book of Daniel is a, is a wonderful example of that, you know, where um, uh, Daniel prays and he receives direction, but he receives a picture of what's going to happen for the rest of the, of the rest of, of time. Of, of, or at least the time continuum that we live in, he gets this incredible direction. And what God wants is, see, what happened what, in the book of Daniel, and again, in the interest of time, we won't turn over chapters 9 and 10. What Daniel says is, as I'm studying the law, I'm studying the book. See, yes. the, the Israel was, was yes. it was prophesied that Israel was going to go into captivity for 70 years. And Seven years was more than a generation. And so they lost. All of a sudden, what happened is the people who knew that it was prophesied they were going to go into captivity for 70 years were dead. You know, they passed away. And so here's Daniel. Daniel is the only person who recognizes we were supposed to be here for seven years, and the 70 years is up. And so he begins to pray that Israel is going to be released. God needed somebody to pray that through. He needed somebody to enter into prayer. So he intervenes in Daniel's life and he says, listen, I need you to, I'm going to show you the 70 years is up. Time is up. You need to begin to pray because it's time to let, let the people go. But if I don't have a man down there praying, I can't do anything in the earth unless it's released by a man. God doesn't have that privilege anymore. He gave it over to man. He gave dominion of the created order over to Adam, and he gave it over to man. Jesus recouped it, but God still doesn't have dominion in the earth like he can do anything he wants in the earth. It must be done through a man. So if there's something God wants to do, he's got to find somebody to pray it in. That's why the office of prayer is such a critical office, and why he's the world to have them begin to pray so that he can accomplish his purposes in the earth. But if men don't pray it in, it isn't going to happen. Anyway, so that's the magic of the, the book of Daniel. That's the, 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 the truth of the book of, of, of Daniel. Now, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, Who hath known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. See, the objective in prayer is not just to get what I'm believing for, but to get the mind of Christ. See, I need to know the mind of Christ. See, I may be believing for something that God doesn't want me to have. This is not a good thing. I, listen, I've been in that situation a lot of times in the past, you know. And uh, in our business, in our real estate business, you know, I've, I've, we've, we've prayed over properties that we didn't end up getting those properties and we later realized property, you know, it was, <laughs> it was just the wrong thing. 
We have, in fact, we drive, we can drive all over the city, and and he, and Gail can point them out. You know, that's a property that we're so thankful we didn't get. You know, that's a property that we created. All we're so thankful we didn't get that one because we got the mind of Christ on for you and Shirley. You know. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, John, 1 John 5, 14 through 15. And again, I want to, uh, you, you, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it in, in the interest of time. But 1 John 5, 14 through 15. This is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, now, if you link that with getting the mind of Christ, see, our prayer, our prayer objective is to get the mind of Christ. So that we know that we're praying according to what he wants us to have. See, I don't want to pray for the things that I don't know he has. You know, he, the, we had some, uh, uh, some, some folks, that we, we went to a prayer meeting here uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody else's prayer meeting, and uh, they were praying over a situation, and they said, and, and we've known these people for a long time, they're friends, and they said, listen, we'd really like you to pray with us over this particular situation. <laughs> and then instantly, you know, when they told us what it was, we knew what the mind of the Lord was over that situation. They were just struggling to get it, and they had God want to say, because then it looks like you just yeah, trying to tell them what to do. You know? He said, well, sure, we'll still pray about it. But we knew what it was the mind of the Lord so over cool. that situation before we left that room, we knew. And sure enough, they came around and, and then we talked to them and said, you know, this is, this is what so cool. we think. They had already reached that conclusion. They already, they, they, they already knew that because, see, in, in, there was a unity of the mind of Christ in that situation, and we knew what, you know, what, what God what God's desire for them was. And they eventually moved in that, and, and, and they were very happy that they moved off in that direction because they knew, you know, because they had gotten in the mind of Christ in that particular situation. That is such a critical thing, is to get the mind of believe in the Lord. And because we just don't have it, you know, the, the, the reality is the natural mind is not the mind of Christ by, by any stretch of it. Uh, Stress of meditation. One of the key principles of prayer is, and, and this is this is a result of faith. It's a result of, of speaking the word in prayer, using using the word in prayer, and and be, becoming uh, seeking the mind of Christ. You become the deciding witness of whether you get what you're believing for or not. See the the uh, uh, the, the the law of agreement. Power of agreement, where two or more of you agree upon earth as touching anything, your heavenly Father will do it for you. That includes prayer with the Holy Ghost. See, the Holy Ghost is your principal prayer partner. I mean, you know, my principal prayer partner is Pastor Gail, and the Holy Ghost is my number one because if Gail's not around or we're not praying about a situation together or whatever, the Holy Ghost is my prayer partner. And he will pray with me over that situation. But I am the deciding witness of whether I get it or not. Because the Holy Ghost can't decide for me what I'm going to pray for. Now, I can get the mind of the Lord, and I can get the direction of the Lord, and I can come into agreement with the Holy Ghost, and then we begin to pray. Now, I've become the deciding witness of whether I'm going to get what I'm praying for or not. Because I've allowed God to change my, uh, to change my thinking. I've allowed the, the mind of Christ to, to come in. That is such a powerful thing. You become the deciding witness of whether the word is going to work for you uh, or not. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We talked about humility and submission and obedience, and particularly James 4, about submitting yourself to, to uh, God there. And uh, once again, he says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. The devil's going to come at you. You know, when you're trying to do things for God or when you're trying to live for God and when you're just trying to seek God in prayer, the devil's going to come after you. And the deal is at the end of the day, you got to resist. you got to resist. That should be our, our daily activities resisting. There's times where the devil's a little more active than others. You know, there's times where he'll leave you alone. 
There's time for you hot later in your But you've got to learn to resist in whatever those, those situations are. You've just got to learn to resist. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, we talked about, and I'll just, we'll just run through these real quickly in the interest of time. We talked about the protocol of prayer. That there is a protocol to, to prayer. There's a, there's a preparation. There's a preparation of the heart and establishing the condition of the heart. Repentance helps to do that. Yeah. Seeking the will of God. Seeking the mind of God. They'll help to prepare you for prayer. But now there is a protocol to how to enter the prayer. The key elements of protocol are number one, the law of the ring. Or two or more of you agree upon or the steps of anything. Your Heavenly Father will agree with The one you want to agree with first is the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That's the most important agreement that you have. Because other people may not see things the same way. They may not be as submitted or committed to God as you are. So the principal person you want to agree with is the Holy Ghost. And you can ask him, what do you think? Holy Ghost, what do you think? You know, tell me, tell me, tell me what's up. Because the, it's the most fundamental of, 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 of laws of prayer, of laws of prayer protocol, is there's a law of agreements at work there. You know, and I want to agree with what God wants. Agreement and the, the, the unity. And, and let me, let, let, let's talk about the difference between agreement and unity. Um, you might not necessarily agree. Now, like Pastor King and I, we don't agree on everything, but we are in unity. In other words, we're going to agree to agree. See, that's a, a, a real key, is to agree to agree. Now, we may not see things eye to eye. We may not have the same position, but we have agreed to agree. Somebody's going to give in, and somebody's going to come into agreement. Now, most of the time, it's me. She would have, she would have, but most of the time it's me that has to give in. And you should decide that you know you're you're the person willing to give in. But the truth is that natural human beings who live on this world we're never gonna see things eye to eye. But the principle of unity says we are gonna act in unison yes. one way or the other. We're gonna act in in, in unison. Now, that's a great principle to use with other people outside your marriage and outside your immediate prayer partners. But certainly with your marriage and certainly with your parents, first of all, that we are going to, we are going to present the united front. We're going to come into agreement. And even if we disagree, we're going to find a way to come to an agreement that we can decide to go forth. Yes. One of us is going to change. One of us is going to do that. We're going to seek God. We're going to seek the mind of Christ concerning it. And one of us is going to change their mind or whatever. But unity says we are going to come together in, in agreement. And that's such a such a power, such a critical, critical thing. The exercise of that will make you good at it. See, nobody's good at that to begin with. You know, you've got to practice that. You've got to work, you, you, you got to work on that to come to the point. Nobody's good to start with. But you can come to the place where... You know, the John Becky Cruz were two of the best people I ever saw at doing that, you know, because they immediately all over, all over to every situation that happened, they come, they have different opinions, but they'd immediately come right in and come into it. I mean, it was, it was, you could watch them do it. It was immediate how they did it. And because they had decided they were going to live together in unity and somebody was going to change their mind, you know, and uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Of course you can. Of course you can. Well, I was too. I was, I was basically through anyway. I, 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 I really asked Pastor Kevin to talk about, you know, some of the, some of these keys. Um, you know, he kind of talked a little bit about it in, in prayer. But um, we are just a situation that started about 10 years ago where we came into agreement with this man. We came into covenant with the man. I have a mask here, I remember. Um, and um, I even had the word, the Lord refreshed me tonight in the presence of God, the scripture that the Lord gave me about coming into unity with this man. Because he's, he was Jewish. He still is Jewish. And he gave it to me from Ezekiel 37. So we came into a covenant relationship with this man in business. 
which we have since we've been married. And uh, and since and as soon as we began came into covenant over this business situation, he continued to fight with us from there forth. Even though I had a word, he continued to be contentious with us all through this process of, of trying to build this building. It took almost 10 years because of his obstinance. Seven. Seven? Was it seven? Okay. But anyway, but the Lord gave me a, a word. And, and as we talk about things coming out, there are sometimes there are situations that he needs you to connect with people to bring them up and for not because of you, but because he wants to do something with them and preserve them. And I believe this this situation with this man, there was a preserving of him, of our connection with him for these years. And God has a, pro, a blessing for us in it. That we have yet, like we talked about, hidden riches and treasures of darkness, hidden riches and secret places. Sometimes you don't understand that process of why you were in and linked. And even when they were fighting with it, you got a word, you're still standing in faith. And you can be assured that God is going to bring to, get to, to you the blessing. Amen? And so he has turned our captivity Psalm 126. He has turned uh, this captivity. He's reversed it. Amen. Uh, uh, separating now from this man. Finally, after all this time. But in the, through the process of these years, we continued, have, like Pastor Kevin said, had to walk and decide to be united. Even though he did, was fighting against his, he was fighting against us for his own purpose. Yeah, but we had to walk in unity. And I believe we, Pastor Kevin, I tell you, you we, you've grown so much in, in character. It's, it's not been fun about how to not just continue to stay out of strife with this man. And, and because it was, like he said in James, where there is envy and strife, there's every evil work. But we have gone, Kevin has, we just shot up. God is rewarding. You don't see how your character and your, uh, 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 your decision to agree, Denise, in your life and in your marriage and all that. You, many times you wanted to get out, but you had to go back. And God said, stay, return, submit, do whatever. It was and God is faithful. He is faithful with you in your prayers. He's faithful when he gives you an instruction, but it doesn't look like it's amounting to anything. God is a rewarder. Amen. And I looked at this verse this tonight, and I, I know that God gave me a word to do that business, to be with that man as, as we united with that man. It didn't look like but God is faithful. There's something that was contained in our obedience and our connection in that that we are going to see the result of. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. That's the God we serve. Even when it doesn't look in the natural like it turned out how we thought it was going to look at. But because we stood on a word. Because I have a hook in the word that he said that we were going to be two. We were going to be like one. We are going to, in Ezekiel 37, he gave you that, he was, we were going to be two sticks put together, and he was going to make us one. And we are going to see the salvation of the Jews. We are going to see, we are going to see salvations come to the Jewish, the, to the Jews. I just know it. Amen. And this process, even in that warring against and, war, and, and with him, is, it was part of God bringing to pass the salvations of the Jews. And so, Lord, we just thank you for those people that have been in Israel and across the earth that have been our Israelites, Lord. And, Father, we thank you that you said they're going to be saved in a day. And, Father, we know you're coming back soon. And, Father, we pray for the peace 
of Jerusalem, and we call them, Father, the Jewish people, would come to salvation, that they would come to know you as Messiah, that they would come to know you as Lord, and Father, what is the name, Yeshua, as Yeshua, that they would come to know you as their Lord and their King. And Father, we thank you. There were many things going on in the earth, Lord. You make yourself real to the Jewish people. You make yourself real to those that are apart from you, Lord. Father, we desire that you would bring many souls to the kingdom in this year. And Father, we give you the glory. We thank you for the things that you've done in this relationship, even though we didn't like Bless that man in the name of Jesus. We have walked, when he asked us to walk one, we've walked two. And continue to do that time and time again. And so, Father, we ask that you would bless him in the name of Jesus. And that you would bring him to salvation in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for the prayers of the righteous. That they will make much power available. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. Pray, amen. Have, have those heartfelt prayers and continue to be, stand on that word for those promises when God gives you something that doesn't materialize right away. Continue to go back to that word and, and put the word, to uh, put the word and expect him to return back to you what you prayed for in Jesus' name. Thanks for being with us. Have a good evening. I was just